Uh, hi guys, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the session by Joel and Hari on unshackling your system under test. Before I, uh, so basically it's 45 minute session and last uh, five to 10 minutes we'll keep for Q&A uh, over to Joel and Hari. Thanks a lot, Sahil, for uh, introducing us. So let's get started. All right. So welcome to this presentation about unshackling your system under test. In order to shift lab, uh, testing through dependency isolation. Uh, my name is Hari. I am a transformation advisor, a coach and trainer, and I'm an API governance strategist. Um, I take keen interest in a lot of conferences. I volunteer for them and speak at a few of them. These are some other conferences I speak at. That's quickly about myself. I'll hand it over to Joel. Hi, my name is Joel. Uh, I've, I've had around 20 years of experience in the industry and uh, I currently coach teams around engineering excellence. Um, I'm one of the authors and contributors to an open source tool called Specmatic, um, which helps you do integration testing without needing any integration environment. Um, hand it back to Hari. Thanks, Joel. So let's quickly jump into the talk so that we can cover all the ground today. Uh, before we get into the thick of things, let me put a lay of the land in terms of the application architecture for a system that we'd like to test. So I have a mobile application which talks to a service, which in turn pulls data from a database, and it also has to drop a message to a Kafka server, to which an analytic service gets information about what's being queried, and then the response comes back to the application. So this is typically all the components that are there in our application that I'd like to test. I want to put a Selenium test together for this. What are the difficulties that you think uh, that you would face in terms of testing the system. I have tested this and uh, a similar system, and there are a few ch challenges that immediately that uh, came back to me. I'd like to understand like what are the challenges that you foresee in testing such a system. Can you please drop those answers in the chat? Any difficulties that you foresee that might happen in such a system? Several moving parts. Yep. That's a very good point. Connecting to Kafka if it's in a private subnet. Difficulty in integration tests. Real-time events. Third-party services being down. Excellent point. Yeah. <laughs> it's integration hell all the way. And I'm glad you brought up all these points because, yes, data integrity, testing Kafka, synchronization problem, the DVC connection issue. I guess it feels like I just worked with all of you on this application, so... Thanks for calling that out. Uh, we had very similar issues also. Uh, primarily, the issues that we faced were complex test data management. I had to prime the data ahead of time and then the database size and all of those difficulties. And the jigsaw puzzle of putting all these pieces together, getting them deployed, and then writing a test against it is not quite easy. And the repeatability of the test itself is compromised because of the complexity. And of course, many more, unlike what you rightly called out. It's not an easy, uh, you know, puzzle to solve. So what did we do about this? So let's understand this system in a step-by-step -step manner, right? So my test right now, I'm trying to focus on this mobile app, which I want to test. So my focus, I'm going to put it on that and say that's my system under test. And if I take that system under focus, the immediate dependency for me is the service itself. And I'd like to isolate from the dependency so that I don't have to deal with these difficulties, right? I want to be able to test it in a controlled and repeatable environment. So I don't want to be troubled with all the difficulties. So what do I do? I could roll up a mock server and immediately I am, uh, you know, isolated from my dependency. I don't have to uh, have the difficulty of having the Kafka or the network connectivity issues or some deployment environment. I don't have to worry about any of those. This is great. But then this is the problem that I hit. This service evolved and then the developers had a v2 version of it i was not informed or probably i missed the update that i should have got so thereby i was running off of a setup which was not a representative of the actual service itself so my service mock is representative of some understanding that i had of how this service behaves in the past and now it's already moved beneath my feet so now i was in a difficult situation right i'm having a wrong test setup how can we go about solving this any thoughts? Ah, nice. 
Thanks for uh, giving a nice segue into some of the topics that we'd like to talk about. Pavan, that's good calling out. Contract testing, that's beautiful. Stubbing the data. Yes, we would like to stub the data, but we also want to verify that the stub data is representative of the real server, right? That's the kind of difficulty we are facing. That's good. All good points. So let's get into it, right? So what we did is we needed a way for the service mark to be truly representative of the actual service itself that it's, uh, you know, uh, helping us isolate. So what we then did is took the API specification of that service, uh, which we are uh, isolating, and then ran that itself as a service virtualization server. Thereby, this is representative of what's happening, right? And this is also a lot less effort because when I had to hand roll the mock, I had to write some code to get that mock running or I had to put the stub data together myself uh, and guesswork through all of that uh, pieces, right? Instead, when I have an API specification, if I to choose my tooling right, I could stand up a service virtualization server practically with no code. And that's the beauty of it. And like how Pawan was calling out, I could then make sure that my counterpart, which is the service provider, is also keeping their side of the promise, which means this API specification is run as a contract test on their side, which means I don't have this difficulty which I had earlier, right? Which is if the service evolution happens, uh, the specification changes, and thereby I would know immediately, and my service mock evolves along with what is happening, right? So that's great. So now the, with this setup, there are furthermore advantages apart from just the fact that you have these two systems in lockstep, while you still have the independence of independently moving forward. Any system, any service mock that you build is based on a concept called canned response, right? Like our stub data, like uh, Neha was calling out. Uh, basically, it is uh, if this request then return this response. Basically, you are setting it up ahead of time that these are the expectations, expected requests, and these are the responses that you want to send back. The beauty of a service block that is based off of an API specification is you can now have the stub data validated against the spec itself to say if it is actually adhering to that specification. Is my stub data even correct? I mean, I have made this mistake, right? In the past, what I would have done is I just assume that certain field is a string or an integer and I have moved forward with it. And maybe I would not even know that this particular stub data is not in line with the spec, right? But now, when you have a service mock that is based off of the API specification, then you the validation is going to happen that, you know, is this stub data according to the schema that's described in the specification? And only then would it be accepted into the service mock. Otherwise, it's rejected right away. So that's the beauty of it. Having your tooling such that your stub data is never stale is super critical. So that way, your tests are always dependable. And immediately when the service spec evolves, your service mark is evolving along with it and it's giving you immediate feedback. So that's an important piece that we had to tackle. Hope that is clear. Okay. Now, what more can you do? There's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do with service marking, right? Uh, let's say I want to I have written some code in the app to handle some resiliency situations. For example, my service could be down. Uh, it could be slow to respond or maybe for some reason I'm getting empty responses. For all this, I have written some uh, sort of handling, error handling in the app, and I would like to test it through Selenium to see whether uh, when I hit certain scenarios, whether the service is down and still the app should be able to now, you know, respond in a meaningful manner without crashing. What is an option to test this? Any ideas? One option I tried, which is a very naive option, is to just simply take the service down. Sure, that's great. I could say, take the service down, run the test and make sure that the test still passes because that particular scenario has to make sure that even without a certain, you know, dependency uh, being available, the app is not fully crashing. It has certain degraded sort of performance rate. So yeah, response timeout, all of those things we got to handle. Now, how do I further test this if I have to? Perfect. Compare the response and the delay. Sure. That's the logic I'd have to put it in the app, right? To make sure that if I have a delay, but how do I simulate that in the service itself? Like I cannot go and change the code can I, in the real service to say, for this particular request, respond after five seconds, for this particular request, respond after 10 seconds. That would not be realistic. Network simulation, beautiful. 
I'm sure most of you would have seen Charles Proxy. So that's exactly what we did also. We put in a network simulator in between and then did bandwidth throttling so that you can then say, hey, uh, this service is slow to respond. So thereby, I could, you know, uh, verify if my system is still able to handle that kind of uh, errors and uh, if my app is still resilient as for those kind of faults, right? All this is great. The one difficulty that we did face with these approaches is the fact that uh, they are not programmatically uh, easy to set up within a Selenium test. I can do all this a little bit manually, but if I want to put up an automation suite and have this uh, repeatable all the time and very quickly, that was getting very difficult to handle. That's when we realized the mocks are a lot more, uh, you know, easier to set up and run with instead of having to have a network proxy. And with Charles proxy, I still have to have the real service available, right? And then it's dep my dependency is still not isolated. I still want to have all the goodness of my dependency isolation and still have the ability to do fault injection. What do I mean by that? I could have empty state. When I make a certain request, I could get back an empty array or an empty response. Maybe I'm doing a product search. I come back empty. The e-commerce app cannot like simply say I am barring right. It has to say, "Hey, no products available with the search criteria. Come back later." It has to be meaningful response. So I could handle empty state. I could I could simulate an error state. What if the service, I mean, got subject, but you get a 500? What do you do with that? So I could simulate that because the service mock practically scanned responses. I can simply say for this particular request combination, return a 500. That's great. What's more. I could even do delay simulation. So certain requests return at a, after a certain period of time, which is greater than the timeout I have set in the app itself. And thereby, I can trigger that particular functionality in the app through my Selenium test to make sure that when there is a delay, this app is able to handle it and gracefully degrade to give a meaningful experience to the user. Right? And through all this, even these error scenarios uh, and all, we want to make sure that those error responses are also schema valid, correct? That's where I always have this open API specification over there, uh, which I'm going to be like, you know, uh, which is what is verifying that, uh, you know, my stub responses, even the error responses are in line with the specification that the service mock is based off of. That's the beauty of sticking to a specification, right? An industry standard spec like open API, which is accepted across for all HTTP REST uh, interactions pretty much it is a very good way for you to standardize and stand up your mock so perfect so moving forward sure we've been testing the app uh, left right and center and we've seen a lot of how we could use api specifications to isolate this app from the remainder of the system but then we can't live in that dream world right i need to test the rest of the system also let's shift focus to the service itself and how do I test this service? Now this service itself is interesting because if I put that under the lens, now this is my system under test, I need to write an API test for it. Right? If I'm writing an API test for it, what are my dependencies? It has a DB and it's called a Kafka dependency. And like, like somewhat, some of you already highlighted, there's a subnet issue with Kafka, I'm standing up a this local uh, database server, all of that is a lot of difficulties that we went through. So let's take those one by one. Focus on the DB. What's the first thing we could do? I could do uh, an in-memory database, right? Which is fairly easy to think of. The first solution that most of us, uh, you know, came up with. But what are the difficulties that you have faced? If I may put it to the audience, uh, by switching a real database with an in-memory database like HSQL DB. Any experiences that you would like to share? It's very easy to say, right? Because just switch it to HSQL and we're all entering land. It's not as easy as it sounds. Empty response due to memory DB issue. Compatibility. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anand, for bringing that up. Beautiful. So uh, most of the databases uh, which are in memory may not support the dialect of the SQL that you're using. For example, if you're tied to a certain vendor and by a chance you are using any dialect that is very specific to the vendor, the in-memory databases may only be able to support ANSI SQL, right? which means you cannot practically have your queries which are uh, built out to talk to that particular vendor-specific database 
to talk to an in-memory DB. That's the first, uh, you know, immediate practical issue that you face. So how did we solve it? Like we have tried using test containers to an extent, right? Test containers are beautiful. I could spin up a MySQL or a Oracle or any other database you know, that you can think of inside a Docker and programmatically also, right? That's the beauty of test containers. I right? love the approach. But then there are certain constraints that we were facing in this particular project that we were working on. And I think that's a problem that I've seen across several other uh, applications also, which is the DB size, right? Uh, some of these databases, the dumps that we used to get even from a staging environment is quite large. And to, uh, to load that up into the, you know, a test container and have it running, first of all, is slow. And second, sometimes it's not even practical to have that kind of file size sitting around. And uh, how often do you take it, right? Maybe I could take one once every day, once every week, but nevertheless, you're still waiting for that problem to happen where the DB dump that you're depending on for your test setup is probably going to be out of sync with the real database and thereby, again, the same problem, right? My mock is out of sync with what is the real setup. That's not a great place to be. Then what we were thinking is, how do you simplify this? I do not want a very heavyweight uh, you know, a uh, test container with a 2GB database running inside of it. So uh, all very complicated. Is there a better way to approach this? So that's when we, uh, because we were uh, dealing with a Spring application, we were able to see that this uh, there is a data source which talks to the JDBC driver, which then talks to the database. So this is the layering in the application, right? So there is a protocol level, which is a JDBC, and then there's a data source, a Spring data source, which is sitting on top of that particular CDBC protocol. So then what we thought is we could potentially just switch out the data source itself for a mock data source and have this talk to a JDBC mock itself, in which case what we're doing is standing up a wire compatible JDBC mock, right? A JDBC mock here is very different from an in-memory database because this doesn't care about your dialects, correct? Your compatibility problem is completely gone. All you are trying to do is given a particular query, what should be my response? What should be my results that I return? That way are completely unshackled from, uh, you know, the particular vendor or anything that you're talking about. You can simulate anything that you need. Plus, you also have the advantage of having to record and replace certain JDBC, uh, you know, interactions, so thereby making your life easy. You don't have to think about the entire schema being stood up. If you are only testing a handful of scenarios in a certain use case, you could just stub out those queries, right? Rather than having to worry about the entire universe of that particular schema and the ER diagram for it. So that's about how we solve the database mocks. All right, so now let's come to the next topic, right? The Kafka. Asynchronous systems are a lot more complex than the systems we've seen so far. At least we were in request response land, everything is very straightforward, uh, you know, SYNAC, Everything is great. But now we are in async uh, dominion, which is not easy. So we have this Kafka topic. Uh, it's sending a message over there, the system under test, and then that is reaching the analytics service. Looks fairly straightforward, right? Practically two systems communicating happily over a pipe and sending messages to each other. What could possibly go wrong? Right? I could send the right message on the wrong topic altogether. I've done this many times as a dev myself. I could send the wrong message on the right topic Still no good. I could send the right messages out of order though, and I still have a lot of problems. Now there are these plethora of issues that you are plaguing our asynchronous systems, right? And these are the hardest of hard problems to solve. Any idea or any thoughts that people in this group have, uh, you know, used? But that'd be great if you could share. How do you test your asynchronous systems and validate this? Yes, that's possible. Message might not even reach the destination because of bombarding the application, it's possible. The queue could be backed up and we don't know what the back pressure settings are. We don't know any of those. What else could go wrong? Even very simple stuff. How is my message even correct? Stop the consumer, sure, good idea. But how do I test the interaction, right? Like, am I sending the right messages? That's what I want to verify. Schema validation, yes. Jason, any other schema of messages should be right. That is correct. Manually check it. Anand, yes, thanks again for calling it out, but I wish that was so easy, man. That's not as easy. Uh, and Jitu, schema validation is super important, but again, how do we do it? On what basis? 
So with that bread and butter, which Anand is calling out, let's move forward and look at what we did say. So yeah, Alankar published directly inside the topic. That's an interesting idea. What are we publishing and who's publishing it? That's what we want to look at, right? So let's take the system and isolate it. The typical diagram that you'll be seeing so far, you must be familiar with it so far, uh, familiar with it by now. I will mock out the Kafka server itself. And like what some of you said, I could drop, let the application drop a message into the Kafka server. I could pull it off Kafka and verify if it is according to the schema. Possible, correct? And the mock server itself could be based off of certain, uh, you know, uh, it's just a Kafka server running and it will receive any message that this application is dropping it. But then, same problem. The receiver of the service could evolve and it might expect a different schema of message to arrive. Isn't this familiar? We saw this already somewhere, right? The deja vu moment. In terms of when you saw it with HTTP, it's the same thing. You had a mock server and that mock, mock server was based off of uh, an understanding that we have of the system. But then the service evolved. So the carpet was pulled under our legs. Now suddenly the setup we are depending on for the test is not true anymore. Right. So what do we do? Again, we need a specification in order to have this whole uh, systems to be in lockstep. Correct. So that's exactly why here we started using async API specification. Now async API specification is a very very uh, you know uh, uh, interesting area of work right now. Just like Open API is widely accepted and uh, helps like you know standardize REST uh, HTTP interactions. Async API is trying to bring under its uh, wings all the interactions such as Kafka, Google PubSub, uh, you know, uh, even to that matter, JMS and MQTT, all of these could be under one specification standard. And if we are able to base our, uh, you know, mock server off of the Async API specification, again, we get all the benefits of being able to validate messages against the spec, being able to verify if the right channel or the topic to which the messages are being sent. So that's the beauty of having a service virtualization which is based off of the async API spec. And then, like Pavan called out earlier, which also means that you have to keep the other party in line with your uh, so your mock itself, which means that requires that the other party runs this async API specification as a contract test on their side. So net-net, what I'm trying to call out here as a theme that you might have seen uh, repeatedly appear is we want to stand up mock servers based on API specifications, which are widely accepted. So that way we have both parties uh, working off of a single source of truth, right? And have uh, every mock work at a wire compatible level or a protocol level like JDBC or any other protocols like for that matter, uh, because that way you are at an isolation point where the systems need not be bothered with, right? They can remain as they are and we can precisely you know, find integration points and isolate them. And most importantly, not to write or uh, write code or to stand up a mock server. Because the moment we have to hand roll a mock server, if we write code for the mock server, then the maintenance overhead of that also falls upon us. Instead, if we base our mock servers off of the API specifications, then as the API evolves, as the specifications change, the mock servers evolve with them and bring all the advantages of having schema validations and other pieces also going along with it. And thereby, again, standing on top of these important specs and these protocols that most of us are familiar with and more, uh, I believe this is the way we could, uh, we have been able to try at scale that this approach works. And uh, I'll hand it over to Joel to quickly go over a demo of the same. Over to you, Joel. Thanks, sorry. Okay, so um, as Hari said, I am going to show you how uh, we ran tests in isolation against uh, an application, a real a real life application. Before I do that, let me quickly uh, go over an architecture diagram so that you understand, you know, what exactly we are testing. Uh, this is a product quote application. So what typically happens is a sales executive is going to you know, put in a bunch of customer details into the application, um, put in, you know, certain parameters, uh, coupons, discounts, whatever it is. Uh, uh, click a button, generate a quote, download the quote and send it, right? Something like that. Um, and QAs and devs, of course, will be testing this application. 
So the way that typically works is uh, whoever's using it will log into a portal. There's authentication and output and username and password, which redirects you to the product port application. Uh, and now you use the application, right? Uh, and the application in turn has certain backend services, uh, certain database, you know, tables that it queries. This is an Oracle database we're talking about. And uh, let, let me let me just switch the screen share again. Uh, I'm going to actually take you to the tests now. With that as an introduction, um, I'm going to take you to the tests that we wrote for this application. Um, as you can see from the tag, these are just the P1 tests. There is more where that came from. Uh, this is basically using a pretty cool test framework called TestWiz, uh, which under the hood is basically using Selenium. Um, and uh, yeah, the tests have run. You can see it running on my screen. Just uh, give it a second. And there we go. So I don't know what's visible, you know, over the screen share, but there's a lot of whiz bang flashy movements on the screen on, on my laptop. Um, and that's because everything has been stubbed out. Everything, you know, the, the application is completely isolated. There's not a single query to an API, not a single query to a database, you know, going out of the sandbox, so to speak, of my laptop. Uh, everything's running completely in isolation. And here we go. Uh, took hardly a minute. The tests have run. Let's quickly check. We have run a few tests, right? Uh, 14 of these have passed. Everything is green, which is good. The beauty is this all ran uh, locally. Everything ran locally. Not a single call uh, went outside my laptop. Uh, but nothing ever is fully baked, right? Uh, obviously, this is not really where we started. Um, just give me a second. Yeah. This test ran locally, but where we started with was an integration environment. And the very first thing that we did was basically swap out the user the user with Selenium. Uh, test was in Selenium under the hood. Um, and uh, the team wrote some tests. They ran on our machines. We did a demo. Um, and you are all very experienced, you know, seasoned uh, QA engineers. I think you would have guessed you know, what might have gone wrong. Would I have some suggestions? What What do you think uh, went, went on in this demo? How did it end? Did it end well? Did it end badly? What might have gone wrong if it didn't went, didn't go well, etc. But uh, essentially, the demo didn't go well. Uh, it, it crashed. A whole bunch of things crashed. Turns out that to start off with, the database, you know, uh, the bunch of entries that had gotten overwritten uh, during testing that had gone on that morning, uh, the authentication server uh, as well had gone down. It's a bunch of different issues that had that had happened, and you know it it didn't work, and it took us some time to even figure it out because this is an integration environment. It wasn't easy to do that. So, I think Hari has been talking about isolating dependencies through uh, you know in, uh, just a few minutes back, um, and that's really the theme of this talk. The answer was to isolate all of the dependencies that you see on screen. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't, you know, the application doesn't need its dependencies. We just need to isolate them from the real ones. We are, of course, testing uh, the system under test, which is a product port application in isolation so that the other uh, issues, you know, don't don't come up and uh, the test only fails when the product port application is at fault. And so the very first thing that we did, uh, of course, was get rid of auth. Uh, of course, you need auth, but this is not the place where you want to be testing against a real live auth server because uh, the most interesting authentication related tests are not the ones that necessarily succeed. They're really the ones that don't, uh, right? You want to be sure that your application is resilient, is able to handle authentication uh, uh, fail failure scenarios properly. So you need to be able to take over authentication so you can simulate all possible cases. Step number one was to take care of authentication. Selenium has this very cool uh, uh, utility for injecting JavaScript. And what basically happens is there's a redirect, uh, as you would have seen in the architecture diagram. Uh, there's a portal you log into, and then the authentication 
uh, setup is that certain parameters are sent via a redirect through the system under test, which is product code application. The application then validates those parameters. We don't need that authentication uh, setup, so we take over the the creation of these parameters and sending them to the application, which then validates. Uh, and this is a handy piece of JavaScript that essentially stubs out authentication completely and enables us to test uh, a bunch of authentication use cases. Uh, I've just done a few, but there are more. And that took care of authentication for us. Um, any questions or should I move on uh, to the next uh, topic? I'm going to move ahead. Uh, Sail and Hari, if, uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can let me know. The next third uh, dependency that uh, you'd have seen on screen was the database. Uh, the database was an interesting one. Um, turns out that there was a very large in-memory cache uh, that the application was sort of populating on the fly uh, whenever it started up, right? So there are, there are thousands of queries going across from the application to the database system. And the application comes up six or seven minutes later. This is not a very good thing if you want to run the tests quickly, get feedback locally on your laptop. Uh, six or seven minutes is too long to be able to run the first test. So some suggestions. Oh, I, I also see a question uh, uh, from Joe. Uh, we were using, we'll, we'll talk about this. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, further down. Any questions, any uh, suggestions on what we could have done in this scenario? How do we take care of the fact that an application is sending thousands of queries to populate a complicated cache? What could we have done? Thousands of queries, they're going across to a database system, uh, the setup. The database is an in integration environment. So this could be running from any developer's laptop, uh, hitting the integration environment. Uh, and returning data. I think maybe waiting for the answer again uh, is fine. Essentially, it wasn't. We we tried isolating, you know, the database at first just by sort of pre-warming the cache. Maybe that was the first thing we tried. Is it possible? But. It turns out it's not that easy to figure out when there are thousands of queries, what exactly is in the cache. And the cache itself uh, was humongous. Uh, lots of, you know, it was like a complicated uh, hash map with lists and objects containing other objects containing other hash maps and so on and so forth. Like that itself was going to be probably an exercise uh, that would run into two weeks. Um, the next thing we thought of doing was maybe running the database locally. The problem with that is it was a really old database, really old version of Oracle. Uh, if you're going to run a database locally for tests, you're going to want to spin up a clean, fresh instance of the DB every single time. How do you do that when, say, you don't have a Docker instance? Right? There was no Docker image available for this uh, version of the database, so it was really difficult to do that. Say we did that, okay? The database uh, file itself ran into DBs, uh, which is a pretty humongous amount of data and itself would have resulted in like a three, four minute or more uh, start time, which again defeats the verb cycle. Cure is almost as bad as the original disease. What then? Do we use HSQLDB? Get out of using Oracle completely. We couldn't do that. There were non ansi SQL queries, so we were we definitely had to use Oracle. What then do you do? Do you clean up the application? You can't do that because there are no tests. You can't refactor the application to write unit tests and isolate the DB that way because there are no tests. So we ended up with this sort of chicken and egg situation. No database. You can't isolate the database, so you can't write tests. You can't write tests because you can't isolate the database. So on and so forth. And it turns out the answer is pretty simple. Just mock out the DB at the JDBC layer. You don't have to touch the application at all. There's nothing, nothing to be done. I'm showing you a small snippet of uh, like no code to be written here at all. This is all done through configuration. Uh, there is this tool called uh, Specmatic, which has a JDBC recording proxy. We pretty much put that in the middle, ran the application, ran the tests. Everything gets recorded to this directory. Uh, and then we took that out of the way. Once that was done, 
uh, and pretty much replace the database drivers locally with the stub data source factories here, which are pulling data from the same directory to which everything was recorded. Uh, and everything just works. The application doesn't even know uh, that it's talking to, you know, uh, something that is an Oracle. Uh, and it just works off the bat. Just to give you a sense um, of, of what it looks like, you know, some expectation files. Right, here's like query with some data. And uh, this just runs off the bat, completely isolated. Oracle is not a problem anymore. The version of the application simply isn't a problem anymore. So we solved that problem. Uh, and then comes the third problem, another set of dependencies you have seen, which is basically HTTP dependencies. Right, here's an example of one of the uh, HTTP open API specifications. So the good thing is for HTTP dependencies uh, that are very popular and very well-known specification formats, I'm sure most of you know about this. There is, uh, for for REST, there's open API. For SOAP, there's Vistal. These are the two kinds of uh, specification formats that uh, that the application used. Uh, this is open API. It's really detailed, you know, your paths, your method, uh, uh, if you have query parameters, uh, data types, headers, uh, you could even put limits. So, for example, if if a particular value can't be, you know, less than say one or greater than a thousand or something like that, you can put literally all kinds of data in it. Pretty cool. Uh, there's another thing for for SOAP that's called Wisdom, uh Web Service uh, Definition Language, um, and all that we did was basically drop these into this file. I think I have the file open. Uh, right here. Drop these into this file called specmatic.json, uh, uh, which basically just, we just pretty much declare it uh, as stub over here. Nothing more. Right? And with no further code to be written, uh, we get a fully capable, fully faithful uh, uh, stubbed uh, application. So this, this was a specification that I just showed you. Uh, this is an actual instance in the integration environment. But locally on my laptop, I don't need it. I have a stubbed version of that application. I've replaced it completely. Uh, I can set expectations uh, on this. And uh, it's perfectly faithful because it's a spec. And because it's the same specification that the backend team is using, I can be sure that when I stub something out, uh, uh, this my stubs are not going to go out of sync with uh, the backend application. And uh, by doing this, uh, I I've been able to stub out all three, right? Let me just let me just quickly uh, go back to my presentation, just 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 to wrap this up. So we stubbed out auth, uh, we stubbed out the database, we stubbed out uh, you know the HAB uh, uh, applications or dependencies, and now this sort of creates this cocoon, uh, right? So everything is running locally, Selenium. Uh, you know, bias tests against the application. Uh, the dependencies of the application are stubbed out. Everything's available locally. Nothing goes off the laptop. Everything's under control. Everything's really moving quickly. Uh, this is, these are all, all of these are basically wire protocol mocks. So we definitely know, you know, we don't have to change any code to uh, account for the fact that stuff has been mocked out, that dependencies are being mocked out. Uh, and our dependencies are actually using industry standard uh, leading industry standard uh, specification formats, which are also being used by the provider. So this ensures that uh, the, the stubs are not going out of sync uh, with the providers, which makes them perfectly safe to use. I I think I can quickly now answer Joe's question. Uh, a DB mock that we used in this application was Specmatic's JDBC mock uh, module. Specmatic also has a Kafka mock module. Uh, the Kafka mock module here uses uh, the async API specification format that Hari talked about a little earlier. Hand it over back to you, Hari. Thanks, Joel. I guess that's pretty much all we had for today. Uh, we'd love to take your questions if we have the time, Sahil. Or do we head on over to the Hangout area? Yeah, we do have uh, we do have time, and I think Joe has another question about the app under test, is it run locally or is it running in a CI? The application under test is running locally. Uh, sorry if I didn't make that uh, clear earlier. Good point. Uh, the application under test is running locally. 
uh, in fact, everything that I showed today ran entirely locally on my laptop. This doesn't require connectivity to the internet, doesn't require VPN to be set up or anything like that. Uh, that as well as the dependencies. Uh, this can also be packaged and in fact, for this application, we did package it to run in CI. But again, in CI, it runs entirely locally to the CI server. So there is no uh, talking to any integrated Oracle database or any actual downstream dependencies. These component tests uh, run completely in isolation wherever they are. So I hope that answers those questions. Um, While well, we wait, uh, again, thanks a lot, Sahil, for facilitating our talk. And thanks a lot to Selenium Conf and the panel for selecting our talk. It's been a great experience. This is my second time presenting here, and it's always a joy to present here. Again, appreciate all the support. And again, to all the audience, thanks again for your patience, for hearing us out.